Some of you may have read uh, the book, The Power of Habit, but it's a book uh, by Charles Duhigg. I think I'm saying that last name right. And he begins the book by describing the transformation of a woman named Lisa in just a few years. Lisa had been very overweight, a chronic smoker, unable to hold a job for any length of time, and in massive credit card debt. And then at the beginning of the book, just four years later, she had quit smoking, she'd run multiple marathons, is in really good shape, had earned a master's degree, and had kept a job, a good job, as a graphic designer for over three years. And so researchers are, were studying her and talking with her and trying to understand what happened. You were this person and now you're this person. What started this change that came about in you? Well, after her husband had left her, she hit rock bottom and she said that she realized that her credit cards weren't fully maxed out and so she had a little bit of money to spend so she decided that she was gonna take a trip to Egypt to see the pyramids using the rest of her credit cards because it was something that she'd always wanted to do. Well, on the first morning in the country, she got up early and took a taxi to see the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids. And as she's riding out in this taxi, she's looking out over the vast desert of Egypt, quite beautiful. And she said that she had this thought in her head, this idea came to her that she wanted to be able to trek across that desert. Well, she knew that she was unable to do that in her current physical condition. And she knew that if she wanted to be able to trek across the desert, the first thing that would have to happen is she would have to stop smoking. Well, 11 months later, she came back to Egypt and she went on that trek. She had quit smoking. And here's what the book says about the change that came about in her life and what brought it to be. It's a quote on the screen here. It wasn't the trip to Cairo that had caused the shift, scientists were convinced, or the divorce, or the desert trek. It was that Lisa had focused on changing just one habit, smoking, at first. Everyone in the study had gone through a similar process. By focusing on one pattern, what is known as a keystone habit, Lisa had taught herself how to reprogram the other routines in her life as well. Now, this is not a Christian book, The Power of Habit, okay? Um, But I do think there is a good bit of wisdom in this description of change that they give, right? There's some observations that you can make here, and they do, about how we work as human beings. God has wired us to change, and he's wired us to specifically change through habits and through practices. And here's the key from a Christian point of view. These habits and practices aren't just things we do just to do over and over again, They are rooted in something. Something drives these habits and practices for the believer and leads to real internal change. What drives them for the believer? It's a particular vision of who we are and where we're headed. That's what changes us from the inside out. So for believers, a new way of life change that is going to be and that should be as dramatic as what this woman experienced in many cases. It has to be built on a vision of who we are in Jesus Christ. That's the starting point. So I told you last week, you probably remember this, hopefully you do, the Bible never just gives us a list of commands to obey and says, here, go do these things. That's not how scripture calls us to live or how scripture calls us to change. It always gives us a context and motivation to foster obedience to these commands. There's always a context and there's always motivation given with the commands. And so here's how all of this matters when you're thinking about a keystone habit, all right? For the believer, I think you could take this concept of the keystone habit and say that what we need to do day in and day out is remember who we are in Jesus Christ. Remember who he is, remember who we are, go back to these truths that scripture gives us about now our salvation and who we are in him. I think that if that becomes a keystone habit in your life, 
it will bring about new desires, new motivations, and it will bring about change in your life. Peter reminds us of this over and over again, right? This is how the first chapter of Peter is structured. This is what he's telling us. He gives us these benefits of the work of Christ. He describes what Christ has done in verses 3 through 12. There are no commands in this section. He's telling us what we now possess because we're in Christ. And then in verse 13, it's like he shifts, and now he says, because of this, here are five commands that you need to obey in your life. And even as he gives these commands, it's not like he just lists them for us real quickly. As he's giving the commands, he gives us motivations and more context for us to help us obey these things. And I think as believers, if we can get this spiritual practice down of connecting obedience, connecting commands, connecting habits and practices back to who we are in Christ, I think it'll bring about all the difference in our lives. And these commands given in verses 13 through chapter 2 and verse 3 will flow naturally. It's not easy. It's not that automatically everything will just fall into place. There is effort on our side to continue to remember who we are and to obey these commands, to root our lives in the work of Jesus Christ, right? There's, there's effort there, but it's effort motivated by grace, not opposed to grace, but motivated by the grace that we have in Christ. And when that happens, we'll experience a whole new way of life. Change will come about. So, In this passage, we started looking at last week, we're looking at five practices that define the new way of life of spiritual exiles. The first one of these practices is in verse 13, focus fully on future grace. Someone told me before the service this morning that he had been practicing this this week and had just seen a huge difference in the way he approaches his days and all of that, and so encouraging to hear that focusing on the future and the grace that's coming to us because of the work of Christ. So I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail on these first couple, but let me remind you of what we looked at last week. Look at verse 13. Let's read this. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, and here's the command, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a command to live with confidence in future grace. The grace that's coming your way, that God has promised is coming your way when Christ returns. So that's the first practice. Secondly, live with distinct desires. Verses 14 through 16. Let me read these verses to you. As obedient children, that's who we are, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, here's the command, you also be holy in all your conduct or your way of life. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Rather than being controlled by pre-Christian desires, by the motivations that are characteristic of those who are apart from Christ, rather than being dominated by those desires, cultivate new desires that are devoted to God and his glory that value him and show that you value him above all else. That's the essence of holiness. It works its way from the inside out, from your desires to your actions. So that's the second practice here. Live with distinct desires. Third, verses 17 to 21, cultivate a reverent fear. Look at verse 17. And... If you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, and here's the command, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So the command here is to conduct yourselves or to have a lifestyle that is characterized by fear. So Peter is saying to live and to act and to behave with fear while you are living on earth as a spiritual exile. Remember that that motif or that picture of us as refugees or as exiles, we're in a distant homeland away from our home country. And so we're to live in a particular way while we're here. He's saying here that you need to live a life that has fear, a reverent fear as a part of it. 
Now, this particular practice you can see on the screen is from 17 to 21. Conduct yourselves with fear is the only command in this whole section. So when I talk about the context and the motivation for commands, everything else in verses 17 to 21 is giving you motivation for how to obey this command, right? So hopefully that brings a little bit of clarity for you when you're reading through this passage. Here's the command. Okay, now how do I obey this? Everything else in this ver- these verses is meant to help you obey it. So let's talk about what it means to live in fear. That sounds odd, right? That sounds out of place. We're told we're to praise God, we're to love him. So how does that match up? Why would we want to make a practice of living and conducting ourselves with fear? Now, in one sense, of course, if you've read the Old Testament, you understand that many times God tells the Israelites to fear God. The book of Proverbs says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So there's precedent, certainly, in the Old Testament for living with a certain amount of fear. But I think to understand this command here, you have to look at the motivation that's given at the beginning of verse 17, the context, right? So look at the beginning of 17 again. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. So he's setting you up there for the command. Notice he says, if. Now, that's not saying that you're, it's not meant to make you doubt whether you're in Christ and have a relationship with him or not. It's not what he's doing there. It is meant to make you evaluate your relationship with God. And at the end of the day, what Peter wants is for you to say, okay, I've thought about it. Yes, I am in Christ. I am a child of God. I have a new family. And so now that I've thought about it, and now that I know I'm in Christ because of the work of Christ, and I've looked to him, okay, now there is a certain way of living that should come about. That's what he's trying to do here by saying, if I have to live in light of this reality. But notice here what the reality is. If you call on God as Father, which is something we've already seen in the book of 1 Peter, God is our Father, but He's also at the same time a Father who evaluates and judges impartially. And notice it says He judges according to each one's deeds your behavior, your way of life. So what's going on here? This is a warning. It's a warning to those who say that God is their father, who verbally affirm that, who maybe even think that God is their father in their heart, and yet they continue to cultivate unholy desires and participate in sinful ways of life. This is a warning to people like that. Holiness is necessary. Holiness is necessary. The Bible makes this clear. You can't mess around with this. Justification is free. It's a gift of God. And flowing from the work of Christ in our lives when we have a a new birth, is holiness. Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Don't come into God's presence. You can't without holiness. You can't claim the promises of verses 3 through 12 and then continue to have a lifestyle as if God is not your father. I don't know if you have ever seen those videos online uh, of people who are just doing absolutely crazy things while they're driving. Dash cam videos, right? I mean, I'll be honest. I can go down this rabbit hole real quickly and stay in the rabbit hole for a long time. Because, I mean, you could just find videos of people doing all sorts of insane things while they're driving, going 85 miles an hour through a red light in an intersection, right? And there's something about watching those that makes me go, what is wrong with this person? 
Like, how can this even happen, right? And it's like, when you see someone driving like that, it's like there's no fear of what could happen if you drive in that manner, right? That's one of the things that I remember my dad telling me when I started driving. You are getting behind the wheel of a weapon. You can hurt people. You can hurt yourself with this. And so that's not meant to say that you should shake every time you get behind the wheel. And it's not meant to say that you should never drive a car or that you should live in fear or in doubt of what might happen. But it is to say that you should have a healthy fear, a reverent fear, a respect for what can happen when you get behind the wheel of a car. So Peter here is not calling us to live in mortal terror. He's not saying, listen, I want you to sit up every single night and doubt God's love and look inside your own heart and try to figure out whether you truly believed or enough, you know, enough or not. That's not what Peter is telling us to do here. But he is saying, when you claim that God is your father, you need to take an honest look at your lifestyle. Because God is both our Father and a good Father, and He wouldn't be a good Father if He didn't impartially judge according to our deeds. So this is a warning here to those who would look lightly on God's holiness and not connect the new birth to a new way of life. So verse 17 is one motivation. I think you can see that quite clearly here, right? So God is judges impartially according to each one's deeds, so conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your exile. But notice, verses 18 and 19 give us further motivation. Peter's trying to help us to obey this command and make this a practice in our lives. Look at verse 18. Knowing, so live in fear, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. To be ransomed is to be set free from slavery. You are bought out of slavery, and you are free from that now. But if you are ransomed to go back into slavery after the ransom has been paid, is to deny the value of the ransom price. It's to treat it as something cheap and unworthy of your freedom. And so here's what Peter's saying. When you live according to the old way of life, when God is your father and you act like he's not, when you live according to old sinful desires, you are crawling back into your prison cell. And you are saying the work of Christ, his blood that is precious and is imperishable is of no value for me. You're judging it lightly. But that's not true. Christ's blood is precious and it is of value. Why? Look at the end of verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. His blood is valuable because he never sinned and he paid the price for our sin and gives us his complete, full, and perfect righteousness. That's the ransom that was paid for our redemption. And it's not just redemption so that you get eternal life one day. It's redemption so that you can live according to your new way of life now, this week, so that your desires can change. But that's not the only reason that our redemption price is so valuable. Peter continues to provide motivation. Look at verse 20. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Christ's blood is precious because his death for you to redeem you from this way of life was planned before the foundation of the world. God loved you even in your sinfulness, Romans 5, 6 through 8 says. Even when you were a sinner, Christ died for you. 
Christ's death is the demonstration of God's love for you so that he can buy you back and bring you into a relationship with him. And all of this was planned before the foundation of the world. That is quite a plan and a price to pay for your sake. And another reason that his blood is so precious and the price is so worthy and so high is found in verse 21. Who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. His blood and our redemption are precious because God raised him from the dead, affirming that the price was fully paid and that our justification is secure. And he gave him glory, exalted him to the right hand of the Father. So now our confidence and our faith and our trust are in God all because of what Christ has done for our sake. So here's the bottom line in this, second, or this third practice here. Conduct yourselves in reverent fear. Live in sober, reverent fear because the means by which your redemption was secured are so valuable. So valuable. So if you're living without fear, if your lifestyle is acting like the price was cheap that was paid for you, then what you need to do is you need to go back and consider and dwell on and think about the work of Christ and what he has done for you and the price that was paid and the love that was expressed and the preciousness of his perfect life offered for you. Go back to those realities and think about them and consider them and then how you should live in light of what he has done. Don't live in a way that trivializes the work of Christ. Fourth practice. Love others genuinely. Verses 22 to 25. You are not saved. You are not born again. You are not placed in Christ in union with him to live as an individual by yourself. You could read the first three of these practices and think, okay, this is me in my relationship with God. And there is some truth to that. But now at this point, Peter sort of moves to the community of believers. When you are born again, you are born into a family and born into a new set of relationships. And that set of relationships and your whole way of life is now defined by love because of the family that you've been born into. Look at verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So let me show you what's going on here in verse 22. This first phrase, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, that's actually Peter describing your conversion. It's his way of saying you submitted to the claims of the gospel. You heard who Christ is. You heard about his blood and the work that he's done and the victory that he's won. And you responded to that by repenting and believing, but by submitting to the claims of the gospel. Now, I know it seems weird for him to use the word obedience to describe our conversion or submission to the gospel. But this is not the only time in Scripture that this happens, and Peter's not the only author that uses this as a way of describing our submission to the gospel. Paul says this in one of the most famous evangelistic passages. Romans 10, How will then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? So you can see belief there is central. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. So he's equating obedience to the gospel, submission to the claims of Christ and who he is, to belief. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So what Peter's doing here is the same thing Paul is doing here. He's describing our conversion and submission to the gospel, and he's saying you were saved for a particular purpose. What is it? Look further. For a sincere brotherly love. So you're saved. You're born again in order to love others genuinely. 
So that's the reality, the benefit that you have, the reason you're saved. There's no command there, but now in the second half of the verse, he takes the same language and says, okay, if this is true, now obey it. (laughs) Now live in line with it. Look at the rest of verse 22. Here's the command. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So let's talk about love here. We could say a million, billion things about love. It is the most fantastic world in the universe and the most watered-down, confusing word in the universe because we use it for so many different things in so many different ways. Let's start here, though, when we think about loving one another, okay? You are called in Scripture to love real people, specific people, The Bible does not call us to a general love for mankind and for humanity. It's not what we're called to. If you say you have a general love for people, it's really easy to not love this particular person. But that's not what the Bible calls us to. We're called to specific love directed toward specific people, okay? So what does it look like to love? I think probably most of us understand that love is directed outward toward the other person. So I think I've defined it this way. Other people have defined it this way. A desire for the other person's good, right? We, I want what's best for you, for your flourishing, for your well-being. Now you have to define what we mean by good and flourishing and well-being, right? But I want what's good for you. And then I'm going to act in order to bring that about. I think it's a pretty decent understanding and definition of love. But here's a question that I think, this came up in our elders meeting the other night as we were talking about this and loving others. But here's where some of the difficulty comes in, right? So you're supposed to love your spouse and you're supposed to love that odd coworker, right? Both words, love for both of them. So how in the world can I encompass both of those? I know it doesn't look the same. I don't love this person at work who gets on my nerves, frankly, the same way that I love my children, and you're not supposed to. But what definition of love, how can we understand love in a way that encompasses both of those? And that's what I want to try to help you with a little bit this morning. Let me give you three words to help with this, okay? And I'm going to put them on the screen. And they all start with an A. So... It's a pastoral thing to do. Apprehend, okay? Now, here's what I mean by this. This is absolutely necessary for you to love another person. Here's what I mean. You have to perceive or apprehend what there is to love about a person. You have to apprehend what there is to love about a person. This is a starting point. Okay, you might say, there's nothing to love about Dave down the hall, my coworker. I can't think of anything that would lead me to love this individual. At the most basic level, every person is made in God's image and as an image bearer has dignity and is worthy of your love as a human being. That's the picture that the Bible gives. Now, there may be more reasons to love a person. I bet you can think of a few more reasons that you love your children than that you love the person at work, right? So there may be more reasons. You maybe have a thousand reasons that you love this individual, and you can recount those. You've apprehended all of those. But at the most basic level, there is reason to love everyone, specifically, individually over here, made in God's image. Now, when we think about God's love, God loves us in that way as his creation as those who are made in his image. But here's the thing about God's love that is so helpful for us as we try to imitate it. We love people for where they are and who they are. They're made in God's image. But there may be a ton of problems and a ton of annoyances, but God loves us in a way that says, I see where this person could be, where they're going. That's redemptive love. God also loves us in a direction and wants us to go in that direction. 
So it is possible for you to love your coworker in a way that says, I affirm that you have dignity and you're made in the image of God, and so I want what's best for you, and I actually genuinely desire that. And then I love you in a way that says, I see who you might become in the future. And that's a, that's a great prospect. And I can get on board with that, with changes in your life that God brings about. That's the essence of redeeming love. Love for who we are and love that takes us in a direction. You have to apprehend these truths about that other person in order to be able to love them. So start there. Start with apprehension. Secondly, I have two A words here. Effective attention. I think love does involve delight. So once you see who a person is and what reasons you have to love them, now there's a delight that comes from that apprehension and that leads you to give them attention. And then it's a feedback loop. When you give someone attention, now there's affection and delight that come from the time that you have given to that person. So very practically speaking, to demonstrate your love for another person and to grow in your love for that same person, you have to give them your time and focus on them as an individual. Again, this is one of the most baseline elements of love for us. So what does this mean? Listening to that person. Showing interest in that person. Asking questions of that person. Because when you ask a question, now you've actually thought about that other person and you've directed your attention outward toward him or her and you've shown interest in them. That's how love grows. And that demonstrates love. You're concerned for who that person is and for what they want, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, what they're desiring, what are they going through, what are they longing for, all of that. Your attention is now focused on that other person. What's it like to be that other individual right now? And then from that, I think there's a delight in that person's unique skills or abilities or who they are, right? So, I think this is where most of us fail in loving others. We really don't show interest in other people because we're not interested in other people at the end of the day. That's what happens. We just want to talk about ourselves because we want other people to see how interesting we are. And so the only way to do that is for me to talk about myself and help you to see how interesting I am. And so we don't ask questions, and we're not concerned, and so we just talk about self all the time. This is a particular temptation for pastors, I will say to you, because we get to talk to people, and no one responds for 45 minutes on Sunday morning, and so we think that everybody just wants to hear us talk all the time. But this love requires a genuine interest in others. It's genuinely curious about others, okay? Lastly, So apprehend who they are, why you should love them. Delight in them by giving attention to them. This is so practical for you if you have children or grandchildren running around. It's a way you can demonstrate love to them and grow in your love for them. And then lastly, action. So concrete actions aimed at the good of the other person. You know where they need to go. You know what good is necessary for them. And you take concrete actions in order to help them get there. That's what love requires. It puts boots on the ground and acts in a way that leads toward their good or their flourishing. So why must we love one another? Look at verses 23 and 24. Since, right, so the command is to love one another earnestly. Here's why. 23 and 24. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, All its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Why must you love genuinely? Because you've been born again to a new quality of life. It's not the same quality of life as normal human procreation brings about. That's what he's saying here. There's a normal human way of life and existence that everyone is born into that doesn't lead to this sort of love and concern for the other person. But you have been born again 
from an imperishable seed, from a God who is love as a good father. And so his love births us through his word to new life, and that new life is defined by love for others. Now, you can see here in verse 24, Peter quotes the Old Testament. This is from Isaiah chapter 40, it's verses 6 and 8, and he does this here for a couple of reasons. One, he's making the point that God's word abides forever. So you're born through the word as the word is preached to you, as you hear the gospel, you're born again to new life through that word, and that life will last, and it will be sustained because God's word abides forever. But he's doing more than that here. He didn't just find a place in the Old Testament that talks about God's word and contrasts it with humanity or with things that are temporary. That's not all he's doing here. What is Isaiah 40? If you're at all familiar with the book of Isaiah and with the Old Testament, Isaiah 40 is a passage written to the Israelites in exile. Same situation here. It's a passage of comfort and of promise. And what does Isaiah 40 promise to the people in exile? It says, look, God will return to his people. And he himself is going to show up and he's going to rescue you. And when that happens, there's going to be a worldwide redemption that ultimately brings about the new heavens and the new earth. That's what Isaiah 40 is anticipating and is promising. And so Peter quotes this passage here because of what he says in verse 25. Look there. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. What he's saying is the the message of Isaiah 40, that's the message that's been preached to you. It's the good news of God's redemption, of God himself showing up, of him bringing about salvation, and it's the good news that as this has begun, God's kingdom is arriving now, and the new heavens and the new earth are going to arrive in the future. God has shown up, and he's given new life, and that's exactly the message that the gospel proclaims to these people, and that's the message that brings about new life that leads us to love. We're now in a community that is defined by love. And that love should bring about continued moral transformation. This is our last practice here. So focus fully on future grace, live with distinct desires, cultivate a reverent fear, love others genuinely, and then lastly, long for moral transformation. Now let's be clear here. We're going to go through this pretty quickly, but I want to make sure you understand what's happening. The command here is in verse 2. So look there, like newborn infants, Here's the command, long for the pure spiritual milk. Now, I know verse 1 looks like a command, but it's not in Greek. It supports the command. It shows the opposite of what the command wants us to do, okay? So verse 1 is the opposite of the command. Now, we need to think about what Peter's saying, what he wants us to pursue when he says long for the pure spiritual milk. I would guess that as you read this, the same thing happened to you that happened to me when I first read it this week. You thought he's talking about the word of God there. Because that's what happened to me. And I actually had that in my notes all week until the end of the week. And I started looking at it in more detail and realized that's not at all what he's talking about. The pure spiritual milk is not the Bible here. The Word of God is not mentioned in verses 1 through 3. Let me help you understand why it's not talking about that and what he is talking about. The word pure here is talking about a moral quality of the milk. So it's it's milk that brings about new virtues in your life. The word spiritual here is the same word that's used in Romans 12 too. It is your reasonable or spiritual service. Okay, so if you put those together, the milk is talking about a reasonable moral transformation that matches your new life in Christ. 
That's what he's saying here. That's what we should long for, okay? It's the opposite of the qualities in verse 1. Look back at verse 1. So, put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. I'm not going to go into detail of what all of those are. You can study those on your own. That would be a helpful thing for you to look at. But Peter wants us to long for a way of life that is the opposite of those qualities in verse 1. So here's what he's saying. And listen carefully to this, because I think it is important for us, and it's an appropriate way to end this whole section that is talking about a new way of life, okay? Peter is saying that in order for you to grow, you have to put in practice what he said. He's saying that if you want to grow, you have to put this in practice and begin to make strides in actually changing in your life. So here's what he's not saying. When you read this as the word of God, as the milk, then what is the application? I need to do more Bible studies. I need to listen to more sermons. I need to read my Bible for 15 minutes more a day and I will grow. Now, I like sermons. I like reading my Bible. I think you should do those things. I think you should do Bible studies. Obviously, all of those are important. We just talked about the word of God at the end of chapter one. But your pursuit of God must go far beyond that. If you think that's the only thing that needs to happen in order for you to grow, then you're missing out on what Peter's saying here. Moral transformation is the milk that Peter is talking about. Why would you want to change and to grow? Look at the motivation that's given in verse 3. If, and it's the same way he used that word if before, right? He wants you to affirm that this is true if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. You will want more of this change if you've experienced God's goodness in changing you. So this is a fitting conclusion to this section. So Peter's basically saying here, look, all these commands, all the motivations, all the context, all the reasons in the world for you to act on these things. So now, in order to grow up into your salvation, into a way of life that accurately reflects who you are, you got to start putting these things into practice. That's what he's saying here. So listen, we are a teaching church. If you're new this morning, I think you probably realize that. It's what we do because it's what we think the Bible calls us to do. Preach the word. Be clear about the word. Understand it and explain it. We like teaching. It's important. You can't grow without teaching. But there comes a point in your life where you can only read so many books about exercise. And you can only listen to so many podcasts about exercise. And you can only hear so many people talk about how you need to exercise. And you can only talk to so many friends about how you want to exercise. And you can take classes that teach about the value of exercise. And you can buy exercise gear for whatever it is you're going to do. And you can dedicate a room in your house to strength training. And you can follow social media accounts that talk about exercise. And you can do all of those things. And on and on it goes. But at some point, you have the context, you have the motivation, you understand who you are, You know what you need to do. So take that first step this week. Identify whatever area it is that you're going to practice this week and take the first step. Get out the door, get your running shoes on and go do it because of who you are in Christ. Let's pray.